Right. So the first question, how did yes form? Cut. Yes formed actually before I joined, so the initial formation was about 1969 while I was um, messing about in a four-piece group called Bodas. So by the time I got asked to join in 1970, the group did have a sort of reformation, if you like. I came in and we changed a few basic ideas about the group. We, didn't, we weren't going to use orchestras anymore. And after their, their second album, Time and a Word, had sort of orchestration on it. And uh, I think really, yes, formed uh, its new direction in 1970, partly helped by me, but partly also that there was just a change happening in the musical direction for the group. So it, it really reformed with the help of me, but really um, because the group needed a new direction. Can't. Is that the sort of answer? That's all right, isn't That's it? That's fine. That's okay. great. I think the best songs that Yes recorded during my span with the group um, were mainly in, in its early period, if I can be so presumptuous. Um, I think that Close to the Edge overall, the 20 minute sort of mini epic, for me is one of the most satisfying things we did because it encompassed so much of what the group could do and actually did do on that one. Instead of uh, going off maybe into uh, tangents and, and musical doldrums occasionally, which we did start to do later in the 70s. This was uh, the epitome of yes. It was uh, very energetic. It had improvisation. It featured all the members of the band and uh, it really did cover the ground. But also I think the same album, Siberian Katru, was also a personal favourite of mine, um, more in the live context when it was a vehicle to improvise on. Most probably the third one, last one, is still the same period. Uh, Roundabout was a song that in 1972 gave um, John Anderson and myself uh, quite a special award for a, one of the most popular songs of that year. And I think you know, that in itself was uh, a nice thing to, to get and it rewarded uh, John and I and the group for writing a song and arranging it in such a highly original fashion. Wonderful. Have you won any other awards for any of your music? Let me think. Yeah, well, John and I won um, Top Composer in Britain through the Melody Maker, and Yes always seemed to win Top Arrangers, as well as the usual sort of you know, top bass, top guitar, top keyboard player. So really, Yes had quite a run at the, uh, the polls. And um, I think there may be a few other things uh, up in my uh, attic that I haven't looked at for about five years. <laughs> but uh, that's not to say that I'm not very pleased and proud of the, of the various uh, sorts of awards and albums, gold albums that I've got. But I find attempting to live with them is impossible. They have to be stored or shelved or something until some stage in my life when they have to come out again and I need reminding. Maybe it's a bit fresh in my mind. I don't need them hanging out to look at. Mm -hmm. Great. What are your fond memories of that band? Well, one of my humorous memories is that we were on the second tour and, of America and um, we arrived at a hotel and everybody checked in their rooms and I remember Bill opening his veranda window and saying, wow, a swimming pool. He sort of threw off his clothes and jumped in the pool. The only trouble was there wasn't any water in it. And uh, he cut his head and we had, you know, delay on the concert and would the drummer make the show? And he went on with this throbbing headache. Um, obviously, success is um, a, a very satisfying feeling. So I would cite also um, the Yes album when it got to number one in England was really exciting because it, it was the first you know, hit record really of any consequence that I'd had, and the group really, it would really put Yes on the map. And likewise, the next year when we released um, Fragile and we came and toured, the timing was, was perfect and a manager's dream. And um, Fragile went to number two. So at that time also, I was uh, very, very pleased with that. So in a way, the high spots, um, once again, early on in the group, you know, Asia 
John Wetton and I got together on the idea that neither of us were uh, doing anything after um, his uh, career had given him the gap and Yes had um, disintegrated. So we, uh, we sat and talked about forming a group and we ended up uh, settling for a four-piece band. Originally we were thinking of a five-piece band. But it, it formed around John and myself's basic initial songwriting ideas like Without You, um, a couple of other songs, um, I think it was, uh, God, I've almost forgotten the songs. Oh yeah, um, The Heat of the Moment, Heat of the Moment. We, we'd written a couple of songs like that, or got the bass ideas going, and then we, we looked uh, for a drummer initially, and uh, once we had uh, Carl Palmer um, in the hot seat on the drums, then Jeff Downs became more interested in our project and uh, came in and completed it. And then we spent all of 1981 uh, rehearsing. We did, I think, about three and a half months rehearsing and then recording. And we didn't actually finish the record until January 82. So um, the group took a long time to form, took a long time to uh, get run in. But uh, it um, sort of crashed into um, the running rather quickly. What songs do you feel show Asian at their best? Well, I think Wildest Dreams is most probably the sort of song that was really all about the excitement and the energy of, of, of four experienced musicians getting together. And we could never quite seem to find that niche again. Uh, Wildest Dreams was, uh, was a song of John Wetton's. It had uh, some good basic ideas right from the word go and also it, it had space for expansion as the group did arrange it uh, and develop some of the ideas, uh, move up the key at the end. Those sort of ideas are relatively easy but, um, to think of but um, a little bit harder to put actually into action and we, I think Wildest Dreams is one of the most exciting Asia things as far as I'm concerned. What are your fond memories of Asia? Do you have any darling memories? <laughs> uh, let me think. Well, I, I was going to cite the, the predictable, you know, the, the immense and the immediate success of the group was obviously very uh, gratifying and very exciting because it opened up many possibilities. Um, doing the videos was quite fun with Godly and Cream, the first two on the album. Um, in a way, the group, uh, we weren't quite so loony as Yes were in the early days. Um, I suppose we were individually. We all had our uh, idiosyncrasies, but in a way there wasn't a collective um, scattiness or, or, or looniness. There was, I think everybody got, got loony on their own, you know. Um, so the overall, uh, my greatest memories of Asia must be really just that it, it, was, it was so quick to peak and um, it was so hard to follow and uh, I would confess that the second album was A, a real um, slow, difficult process and it was musically and technically unsatisfactory when it was finished. So really Asia was all, was all about 1982. Uh, we had a fantastic year. We, Everything we did in 82 worked. We went to Europe, we played in Wembley, uh, and we toured America for, I think, 10 weeks. So um, we, we had definitely had some immense highs and a few serious lows, you know, just to bring us back into reality, because a group that took off that quick um, maybe was, was destined to fall quite quickly as well, which I think, um, well, I'll leave that to the future because the group is still going without me and I mustn't be too condescending. Who are your musical influences? My musical influences really must be in about three categories. I mean initially when I started playing the guitar there, were, um, there was a whole new thing happening with uh, you know, Elvis and the Every Brothers and they had Chet Atkins playing guitar for a while. Um, there were um, instrumental groups, unlike you know, 
there are today, like Dwayne Eddy and the Rebel Rousers and all that. In a way, that was the initial um, kickoff for me. There, there was a, a certain guitar mania, and um, definitely Chet Atkins always has always intrigued me uh, because he, he's very hard to pinpoint really what he is. He's a he's a very versatile guitarist, maybe not a very fashionable guitarist, but then come the mid-60s, there was you know, a big change and everybody wanted to write their own songs and uh, the group I was in started doing that. We changed our name overnight. We almost changed our coat, if you like. We just changed everything about the group from one week to another and we became a group called Tomorrow, influenced you know, by the birds, by uh, the Beatles, by... Um, it was a group phase when everything was a group. Uh, um, and I, I liked the big three. I thought the big three were a bloody great British group who, who made only about two or three records ever, but they were all very energetic. Um, similar to, you know, out of the Beatles sort of clone, but they were much rougher and rawer. And I tend to think that that's when the guitar hero started to appear. Um, Brian Griffiths, guitarist, who consequently disappeared or doing a, a milk round or something, uh, had all the embryonic stages of Guitar Hero. You know, he, he was very talented. Uh, he had an original sort of approach, a bit like the kink sort of... Dun, 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 dun. You know, he had that all going very, very early on. Power stuff. Um, but then once the, the 70s came in, uh, I started to sort of mature, I suppose. I started listening to all sorts of music, you know, from Hungary to Brazil, you know, Vila Lobos, classical music, ancient music. Uh, I, got, I met people like John Williams and Julian Bream. I met people that I admired tremendously, um, like Les Paul. And, and um, I suppose really that, that, that third stage was really much more about actual strong musical influences and, and, than really popular trends. So I started to find my own um, satisfaction out of listening to obscure things, things like hurdy-gurdy music. You know, it's an instrument you, you turn a handle on and press buttons. I've got one, actually. I've occasionally played it in studios. Usually it has a very comic reaction. People just fall on the floor laughing that I'm doing this. But those sort of instruments um, actually give me a sort of uh, new viewpoint on the guitar. You know, I can go back and imitate or, or, or uh, get inspiration from things that normally uh, people would um, think uh, are inspiration maybe for a different sector of people. So um, sometimes I look back at, at guitarists like Big Bill Brunsey, blues players. Uh, really a lot of American musicians have inspired me tremendously. I'm not just saying that because I'm on MTV, but that was my initial thing, but then I realised in the 70s there was a much bigger, bigger place than that. And um, going to Japan last year, connected again with MTV, I found it much more um, of a cultural place to get into. Uh, before when I went there I just starved for three weeks because I couldn't eat any food because I don't like raw fish. And uh, so really I suppose as you mature a little, you can find more things to interest you, sometimes in the same area. And uh, I certainly now, I, go to, I went to see Segovia about three weeks ago, he played in, in England. And people like that are always going to have some effect on me because you can't play, you, nobody can play the guitar like he does. And uh, that's a very important function of, of an instrument that you can be yourself on. I find with, you know, with a drum machine or a program synthesizer, you're, you're merely manipulating technology. You're not really um, releasing uh, some sort of alpha rhythms or, 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 or something that sort of transcends the grooves in the record. Um, but I like those things that inspire me from within, as opposed just to, oh, I get knocked out, I get a new gadget and you can press this and that. It's great, but it's short-lived, it's a toy. And uh, I think, um, well, I still look for the more earthbound sort of things, uh, sometimes uh, rustic or uh, sometimes antiquated. I, I like old instruments. I like the way they allow personality to dominate them and, and use them. What uh, musicians have you played with and admired? 
Well, working backwards, last year I played with um, Steve Morse. Uh, he's a guitarist who's had a uh, uh, peculiar kind of success. I mean, he, he's done the uh, Guitar Player Awards, you know, three years top guitarist, and I think he's a very happy musician. I hope you're right, Steve. Um, he's a brilliant musician in as far as um, he the mixture, I suppose, of so many, you know, from Jeff Beck to, to a bit of me to, to a wider range of guitarists who, fresher, newer range of guitarists who uh, are finding their place. But I, I was very shocked to find that everybody in the States wasn't buying Dixie Dreg records. You know, I was horrified when I came and realized these records weren't a huge success. They hadn't sold millions. Because over here, when I got them, I thought, well, that, that's obviously a million seller record. I mean, they all must be. Because they were so ingeniously constructed. Maybe highly technical. But anyway, Steve Morris, I played with him last year at this club in New York called My Father's Place. I had a great time. Uh, Several years before, I played with Les Paul in, in England. Um, that was also very exciting. He, he threw me totally. He'd been playing 12 bars for about, you know, 12 bar sequences for about half an hour. And then it was sort of, yeah, come up, you know, come up, Steve. And he just threw one on me. Do you know <laughs> this song? You know, never heard it in my life before. So I had to bluff my way around. And when you have to bluff your way around with a guitarist as important as Les Paul after he... He developed multi-recording. He, he really hooked echo to the electric guitar and made, gave it a dimension that it's always relied on. And, um, and I, of course, wanted to uh, impress him. And I had to really bluff. So, Les, I was bluffing like mad because I didn't know what the hell, what the chord sequences were. So, um, I've met people who, like Chet Atkins, I mean, I'm talking about guitarists, really, because um, I'm more interested in guitarists. But of course, I've met also, um, you know, at different times, singers who've been important to me. But uh, I've also missed opportunities. Like, I mean, I was a big Bob Dylan fan, and I still am. I particularly like the last album he did with Mark Knopfler. So, but I wouldn't have known what to say to him. Only, well, do you need a guitarist, you know, on your next record? But uh, I think your impression of, of, of people um, usually increases when you meet them, and uh, it, it deepens. And therefore, the few um, people like that that I've met in the guitar world, uh, I've usually gone back and, and had a good chance to rethink my impressions of them. Like when I met Les Paul, for instance, I discovered that he, he'd got a fixed an arm he'd hurt in, his, in, a, in a car accident, and he really, really liked humorous people. You know, he didn't like boring musicians, you know, people who were long-faced and serious, you know. And when I went back and listened to Les Paul's records, I could then see that all this joy in them was, was a lot to do with this, you know, awareness of humour and not taking yourself too, too seriously. Can you describe your perception of the rock music scene in England in the late 60s, early 70s? I should be able to describe the, the 60s, 70s period, because I suppose I was, you know, I was quite a part of it, but um, the, the, the 60s to me were, um, were really a very naive sort of time, and we were, you know, the music scene, there were, there were sh the sort of shows, the sort of sound people were getting on stage was really dreadful. I mean, there was no other excuse for it. There was no proper PA systems until... Uh, 1970, in fact, when Yes bought one from the group Iron Butterfly. They brought one over and we had to go through hell with the customs men to buy this PA. Sound, the sound was restrictive uh, until the 70s, but the, um, I think the excitement was enough to inspire quite a few Americans on, to get on the tracks. I mean, I'm not really, I'm talking after the, after the Beatles had become accepted. England carried on uh, making progress and uh, being progressive and also when flower power psychedelia was happening, I suppose it was happening in, in America first, it seemed like here uh, we, we, we came up with our own kind of music and the Floyd, Tomorrow, um, the bands that came out like you know Stevie 
Winwood, with Traffic and all those bands, we were really offering a um, very quirky original style of music. I think then the 70s brought the, uh, I, don't, I wasn't going to say super group, but more the, um, the technical sort of side out. And, and I think uh, English musicians had always felt that American musicians were very, very talented and technically very efficient. But somehow I think that England surged on a bit more there and out of it came the sort of thinking man's rock groups, you know, like Yes, ELP, Genesis, blah, 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 you know, quote, quote, quote. But, um, and out of that, I suppose, was, was the headache of, of how do you keep going, you know, and then we started being called the techno rock bands, and there were some really awful things that really we laughed at, quite honestly, when we used to buy the NME and it sort of said, you know, one of the worst records Yes ever made has got to be Tomato. Well, I sort of agree, but it went on and totally ripped the group apart, you know. And in a way, we were, we were le leading ourselves open to that by the sort of music and the complexity and the sort of airy fairiness of what we were doing. So, but of course, out of that, America started breeding, you know, the Bruce Springsteens and the, you know, a lot of very substantial artists who are still making records now and still selling really well at concerts, you know, and, and, you, and I think what it proved overall, that sort of time span, is that it doesn't matter how many hit records you have, if you can't get out and, and play really well on stage, then, you know, you're bluffing a bit. And uh, I think that that maybe is what England's going through a little bit with some of its sort of young bands who make very good records, but they still haven't had the experience of performing in, in the big context, you know, of the 10,000, 15,000 seater. I mean, I'm not knocking them money saying, well, they've got to gather that experience before they can really make it really come off. But, I mean, the people who have already had that experience, like Billy Joel, say, can walk on the stage and get the whole place, you know, 20,000, 30,000 people going, you know. But I think you put a, um, I don't know how, I know Duran Duran are doing very, very well, but they're still quite a young band to, to get all the charisma together and, uh, and all, you know, the sound, the staging, the music, the, the order of the show, personalities, all this going. I mean, it's quite a tall order. And um, it was certainly a, a, an interesting challenge that groups, in the quotes that I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, actually pulled it off. I and mean, we were quite naive still. Uh, when, when, when I went there in 1971, we got, I, the first show I did was in front of 15,000 people. Now really, up until then, I'd only played really clubs and what we call town halls, and then maybe the concert hall circuit, like, uh, you know, in, in Amsterdam and, and Germany, and quite big places. But um, suddenly it was on stage at Edmonton, Ontario. I, no, Ed, Edmonton's not in Ontario, is it? Well, sorry, Canada, but... Somewhere near. Edmonton, Canada, um, playing with Jethro Tull, and it, it really was exciting. I mean, it was almost electrifying to be suddenly responsible for entertaining so many people at one time. That was, uh, I think, what I learned out of the 60s and 70s. I hope I learned it reasonably well. I don't forget it. Just how to come on and, and give them a good show. This show is about the progressive rock scene, highlighting bands such as Traffic, Jeff Rosewell, Genesis, ELP, Yes, King Crimson. Any comments on any of these bands? Then none of them are in the charts at the moment. <laughs> What's the idea? No, well, all those, but the bands that we've been talking about um, all relied partly on good production. Otherwise, the complexity of the music would never have got through. And sometimes it was a real battle to get the, you know, the bass part plus the keyboard and guitar. And now, of course, production's taken even more of a forefront in that a lot of records are just very well produced, very simple musical ideas. And what we were trying to do was have very highly complex ideas well produced. And um, it's definitely easier to have a highly produced simple idea than a well produced complex idea. I think um, the bands that I 
felt excited about. I was always excited about ELP, but really, without this sounding like a put down, because it really isn't. Initially, and most probably, mostly because of Keith Emerson, because um, he, um, he had a feel about him that, that gave him a lot of presence, you know, to me. And I liked that style. I think I liked Genesis a lot when they, um, just before Peter Gabriel left, and, and, and then when Phil suddenly found the voice, you know, and, and I think Steve Hackett encouraged him quite a lot to, to uh, come out of his shell, you know, and sing. Um, hang on, is this question, what do I think of them? What do you think? God, what do I think about them? Well, these progressive rock bands of the early 70s, they, I had, didn't have much, enough ch chance then to really decide what I thought about them because in fact, they were in competition. And when you're in competition with people, you have a rather tainted view of them. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a down of you. It's only that uh, there's elements of competition and their strengths um, you tend to weigh up against, i.e., yes, I was in. And uh, yes were, had an inner ego, egotism that was rather useful because we felt that yes had it all covered. You know, we had great vocal harmonies, a great guitarist, great keyboard. We were always seeking to keep the standard of each unit and, and, uh, and each uh, area covered. And as soon as we didn't, you know, as soon as like Bill left, then we had to get, you know, a great drummer in. So really, I, I remember it more as a semi-competitive musical array where it was like, uh, not keeping up with the Joneses, but keeping ahead of the other groups that were coming up behind you. Because when we went to America, ELP were headlining and we used to support them. But the, uh, the guys used to be at the side of the stage with long faces, you know, yes, we're trying to do another encore, you know. There was this, you know, we were always trying to keep ahead, even sometimes when we were behind, we were always trying to keep ahead. Um, I think it wasn't really until 1980 when there was a sort of a, a lull in, for me when yes uh, split. I could look back and maybe start to enjoy more some of the other things that, they, that the groups were doing. Um, but I think Jethro Tull was a little bit of a mixture of the of 60s, 70s, because when we went, they were, they were already huge, and yes, were totally unknown. They did perpetuate. Some of them had very long careers, which, which uh, is quite surprising. And i.e. Jethro Tull, I believe, has just crept in the you know, American top 100 again. I mean, that, that is a very long career. So um, those groups must have secretly inspired me all the time because, other, you know, it was fuel. You know, listen to, you know, hear the new Genesis record and, mm, well, they've damn good, they've got good songs, but guitarist isn't quite as good. You know, there was, you know, when Steve Hackett left, there was a sort of guitar gap in the group, really. And um, although Mike Rutherford was doing all the guitar stuff very well, it wasn't a la yes, it's sort of always trying to be the virtuosos, you know which sometimes we weren't, but we were always trying to be. Um, that's it, I can't say any more. Do you want to just check, actually, do we cut that? Mm. Can you just uh, find out about the uh, outside? Make sure the Okay. Who are your guitar heroes? Um, guitar heroes are just, uh, there's just so many of them, I don't really know where to start. I start really when I discovered um, when I discovered the guitar. It was really Les Paul who I first ever heard, you know, and said, "Oh, I like that sound." But of course, it was such a um, marvelously contrived sound. You know, it was all very well recorded and all this, and uh, it was a whole musical style. So. Um, when I got into the guitar, I didn't, uh, I didn't know, you know, I couldn't make it sound like Les Paul, you know. But at the same time, people were saying to me, look, you know, popular music's all very well, but there's a lot of guitar you could learn from that's outside the, you know, popular music and rock. So this is partly my family, and they, maybe because they didn't want to hear 24 hours of uh, The Shadows and Cliff Richard and all this, they, they, you know, they wanted to change my viewpoint. It's quite healthy, though. Um, 
And initially I heard Django Reinhardt was the first jazz guitarist I heard and um, took me by storm. I mean, I had to, had to listen to this constantly. So Django, and then the great Tal Farlow, who's uh, a legend in his own lifetime. I mean, he's much more a guitarist guitarist, which I think is very unfortunate because, you know, you get the George Bensons and, you know, Wes Montgomery's and fantastic players, but Tal has got uh, very much his own um, approach, uh, harmonically, technically too, that um, he's one of the, the fastest guitarists um, that you can hear play. He, but that isn't, it isn't just because he's fast, it's because he's fast and comprehensible, uh, intelligent, melodic, which of course a lot of people aren't, you know. Um, <laughs> it was, I think, you know, you get these records you see in uh, guitar shots, sometimes done by brilliant guitarists, like Jimmy Bryant is, is, was a wonderfully uh, advanced guitarist, but occasionally, somewhere along their career, they do a record like, you know, the fastest guitar in the West or something, and as a guitarist, I can't help but buy it, and I put it on and go, oh, God, this is all, it's all cliche, you know, but... Um, Speedy West and Jimmy Bryan in their early days, when they used to be a duo, pedal steel and um, guitar were phenomenal. But uh, really, early days, Rick Nelson's guitarist and later Elvis Presley's guitarist, um, James Burton, was one of the most inspiring guitarists because he was uh, the first one to just use the guitar melodically. This wasn't guitar cliches, you know, like any of that stuff at all. This was just tunes, really. Just like the vocal line played with fantastic expertise. And um, he was with Rick Nelson, who's uh, most probably, a lot of people won't know much about him. But of course, Elvis did make more of a mark. Um, but, and he had the great guitarist, Scotty Moore, with him originally, who used country picking style, which, uh, showed really great integration that rock music was making. Rock music wasn't a new kind of music, it was a new mixture of, of country, a bit of jazz and, uh, and folk and things. God, this sounds awful. And um, it came together and, and Scotty Moore was really a bouncy, bouncy guitarist. You know, it was, it was simple stuff but played oh, in, in such a wonderful way. But I think the different styles of guitar that I listened to, like I used to like flamenco a lot, people like Sabicus and that, but actually I really loved it when Paco de la Cia came out, uh, out of Spain, if you like, would be the best way of saying it. He came out of Spain and started making records in Europe. And um, since he's just recently toured with uh, John McLaughlin in the guitar trio that they, they annually tour with, and um, he is in a film called Carmen. It's the Spanish version of, of the Carmen story, which is really worth going to see. There's not enough guitar in it, obviously, but um, he uh, has done some marvellous records. He'd just done one on compact disc, actually, that's sensational, called Solo. Two words in Spanish. My Spanish is terrible. I won't attempt it. But he, at least, um, is so fresh. And although he's playing flamenco, it's not, um, it's got a fair bit of stomping and singing going on, but it's not, it's not like, oh God, turn off the, the, the um, castanet player, you know. You don't feel like enclosed in this um, deep ritual of, of uh, Spanish flamenco music. It's much more about today, you know, and that's what's great about Paco de Sia. He's, he's a performer right for now, and you can listen to it, it's got fretless bass and percussionist. You know, it's not a whole lot of people going diddle -diddle 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 -ding. It's really much more uh, exciting than predictable flamenco. But I would like to just cite, maybe as my last example, a guitarist who's had so much success and yet not so much as a guitarist, and that's George Harrison of the Beatles. I think he did a great deal for, for me and other guitarists in, in the organised rock guitarist, not the blues wailing guitarist or the uh, just guy who improvised all the time but but because of the um, I suppose restraints that the Beatles put on the musical needs of their group I mean they had great songs they had great singers you know what more do you need other than great guitar riffs which which uh, I, George came up with and they used Gretsch guitars and besides 
you know, the likes of, well, I suppose, Neil Young, um, rockabilly groups, um, Jen Atkins, again. Uh, but besides that, I, it's one of the, uh, Eddie Cochran used Gretsch guitars, but, you know, George Harrison used Gretsch guitar. That was the sound of the Beatles to me, was this sort of twangy, um, individual sound. It wasn't all Fenders and Gibsons, which were really very recognisable sounds. When you think of, say, U2, I mean, it's very much a Fender sound. Or you, you, um, you think of um, like most of the blues guitarists, you know, it's very much a Gibson sort of sound, very often. Um, can't generalise too, too much without coming unstuck. But um, today, Today, there's, there's it's got to be me, I suppose. It's gotta be, I've got to get out and do the damn thing all over again. That's what I want to do. I want to bring my music right up to date, because I think, in a way, 1980 started well, and I think Asia was a good start to the decade, you know. But uh, I definitely want to... Uh, no, this is silly. I can't say this. Can't. No, I can't, really. You have to... You have to find a way of ending that, because it's a dreadful way. I mean, it's really like, hey, guys, you know, <laughs> it's going to be me now. No, I hate that. All right, we'll sort that one out. Is that, is that any, you're looking a bit hot under there. Right? I am getting a bit hot, actually. Yeah, yeah, I just, you open the door, is that okay? Can you just kind of Not really, no. Um, they, they had records, you know, and we had the traditional sort of 1950s radiogram, you know, this big thing with, with a speaker underneath it. All it went, it was very bassy, you know. So we had a collection of records which ranged from sort of uh, marching tunes, you know, brass bands and things. Uh, a bit of Guy Mitchell, and I suppose what I mentioned earlier was Les Paul and Mary Ford records. But uh, before I got on to them, um, I used to find marching bands quite exciting. I mean, much like my nine-year-old does, he loves to leap about to music. Uh, he likes, you know, hip-hop and, you know, scratching and all this, you know, which is quite unusual, I think, for a nine-year-old. But it's healthy. And likewise, I like think anything I could jump about to was, uh, was good fun. Until, you know, you start wrecking the chairs and wrecking the sofas. And then... Um, the only thing was I had an uncle who, not on my side of the family, on the other side of the family, sort of, who um, played the clarinet. And I used to ask him questions when I was young about this. And at the same time, I took up the guitar. My brother, Philip, who is a film editor in Australia now, he took up the clarinet as well, because he liked traditional jazz. So we had a, a guitar and a clarinet trying to be learned at the same time. And my parents were tearing their hair out, and uh, my brother Phil started get it going off into jazz, uh, modern jazz, I suppose you'd have to call it. And uh, the clarinet didn't really fit, you know, into modern jazz, so he stopped playing. I think, in a way, that was a great thing because it gave me complete freedom. There was only one instrument being learnt in the house. I had the reign of the noise, you know, and the clatter of um, pretending to play things or trying to find out how to play things. But they were very, um, very considerate, really, about it. Um, I think it's very hard, if you're not a musical family, to be able to judge somebody's musical ability, um, which, by the time I was um, 17 or something, they, they did start to help me much more, help in quite often the fashion of money, of helping me to get a good guitar, um, coming to odd gigs and just showing a bit of support. But really, they're, um, I think my father is more musically inclined than my mother. Um, my dad would be quite happy to turn records up very, very loud and just sort of sit there, you know, bubbling along. But my mum only listens to my records, you know, and she usually says, we don't hear enough of you these days, you know, things like that. And, when, when I played her alpha, she said, well, where are you? you know, and I said, well, that's a good question, actually. And um, they, they have their own quiet way of accommodating music, but they're not what, what, by any means what you'd call a sort of a musical family where everybody was 
playing and singing and all that sort of thing. It was much more reserved. In Yes, you merged classical with rock. How did that combine? Um, it was good timing with Rick coming in the band and me because we both, Rick had had some, Rick Wakeman had had some classical, um, a year or something in the music college, you know. And people usually thought that I'd had some sort of musical training, which I hadn't. Um, but I was, um, I suppose, I think part of it was just the mixture of an acoustic guitar style within the group. I usually think of Roundabout when I asked the question you asked about the classical influences in, in rock, uh, in Yes in particular, in the early 70s, was really the marriage that we were trying to do, having acoustic guitars involved in, in the band. I, I tend to think that's one of the things, the sort of more dramatic sort of guitar cadenza style of, say, the beginning of Roundabout was much more <clears throat> classical than, than anything else, although musically the ideas were, were really quite simple. They were more like folk bits, you know. Um, I think when Rick came in, he added a certain twiddliness to things, and lo and behold, we had some rather kitsch uh, version, um, a bit like um, the Bach uh, temp well-tempered clavic clavichord record. There was a bit of that on Fragile, uh, Brahms, Cans and Brahms or something. Uh, but I don't know whether it was in the singing, whether or not maybe there was a bit of that in Chris Squire's voice. He was a bit of a choir singer. Um, I don't know how you can relate to uh, it's percussion. So really, I would say it's most probably in the, the acoustic guitar and, and Rick's um, twiddly keyboard approach. And also, of course, we used to use the sort of church organ on a few records. Um, occasionally, we went to great lengths to get a church organ on a record, because as you can imagine, it's, uh, churches don't have recording studios built in them. So you either had to take the recording studio to the church or pipe the church into the recording studio, which we did in um, in Switzerland once, where we, many miles away, Rick was playing the song, uh, oh, what's it called? I think it's called Parallels. And Rick was playing it while we were actually playing it about three miles away in the studio. That story's, not the first time that story's been told, but it's the sort of thing that we were doing. Or you take a quarter inch tape into, you know, a Revox or something into a church, record the organ part, and go back in and mix it into, uh, like we did Close to the Edge. That's how we did Close to the Edge. Big organ comes in in the middle. It's a real church organ. And I suppose those sort of ideas were a bit weird at the time. And um, in some, of, some of it worked, but some of it did add the, the classical overtone to the group. Great. How does your current project with uh, Steve Hackett come about? Ooh. Oh. What will it be? You knew. I was trying to get that secret. Oh, good. Um, Steve Hackett um, popped in to see my manager and said, uh, you know, sort of, you know, he'd, he'd done uh, several, if not many, solo albums, and he, was, he wanted to do something that was maybe a little bit more worldly than sort of local. And... Um, Brian sort of said, well, he, do you know that Steve's, you know, he's not in Asia anymore. So um, we met up and just had a preliminary talk, much like you've got to, to break the ice and see if there's any common ground. And um, we both felt like doing a group without keyboards, which is what we're doing. And um, because I haven't done a group like that since um, 1969. And in a way, it gives guitarists more scope and freedom not to have the sometimes blanketing effect of, of multi-keyboards in, in the band. So although I've worked in that environment happily for, for some time, I'm uh, quite like a double guitar idea. Uh, I think there's things that Steve and I can do for each other which are deservingly right, befitting, if you like, for us to do for each other. And um, gives me scope to do, uh, I was felt I was, quite a powerful electric rhythm guitarist and, you know, the choppiness that I can add. Steve's got a, a lyrical uh, approach. We can swap that round. We can uh, explore, if you like, the guitar area a little bit more deeply together. And um, the projects come together 
quite comfortably and uh, it's definitely getting more and more exciting each day. Little things keep happening. Um, we, we're trying musicians out. We've, uh, in secret, we have uh, an excellent young new singer to spearhead the group because it's not going to be an instrumental group. Um, I think that'll be a little bit indulgent, but I think maybe through this group we can start to introduce the guitar instrumental area again and hopefully move on to that, perhaps later. Um, but the basic premise of the group is no, no keyboards, uh, no hogwash, no hard sell, just uh, some internal friction going on in the group, the right kind of friction, not the anti sort of negative friction, but the a good guitar um, project really that's more more of a uh, expose, exposing area. So we want to be exposed a little bit as guitarists because I think yes in Asia often people say, don't you feel a bit cramped, you know, with all these people doing the thing next to you, you know. And uh, no, I didn't at the time, but now I feel like it's a really great time not to have um, any imposing sounds around. Just uh, working on, you know, bass guitar, two guitars, drums and vocals. I think it's going to be quite refreshing for us and not to... In actual fact, what we've been talking about every day together, Steve Hackett and I, is the the guitar part syndrome, instead of it being guitar part versus keyboard part, which has been for many years my, my job, you know, to sort of try and balance, sometimes with great difficulty, the roles of, of two potentially soloing instruments, providing one has to provide back, back up for the other, and when the song's involved, then you've got two instruments that could back up. It gets a little bit complicated, Sometimes you just literally got to stop playing. Um, so the Steve Hackett, Steve Howe project is uh, definitely uh, a new lease of life for me. And uh, since I've started it, which is over the last two or three months, my guitar collection suddenly is alive again. You know, I look at my 150 plus guitars and I think, boy, you know, these are gems, these are gems. When in a way, I suppose, being in a group with a keyboard player, it was there wasn't enough room to look at the guitars and, and see these as my uh, tools. You know, they were more like a collection I had at home for my own amusement, you know. And, but now I see them coming out much more into the group itself. And also, it means that Steve and I uh, have much more freedom writing and there won't be so many egos struggling for, you know, for, for the credit or in fact, the money, but there'll, there'll be more of a, I think, an honest appraisal of um, the best of what we do, because he's sort of picking the best of what I do, and I'm picking what the best of what he does, which is a very nice, shows you a very nice side to a partnership. It's not as crowded as four or five people, all demanding and attempting to get a sort of an equal balance, um, because this group is going to be basically him and me, um, with some young, younger guys to sort of help maintain a fresh approach because we want the music not to be, well, basically in a word, predictable. We don't want this to be a predictable arrangement. Uh, we want it to be uh, something different. <laughs> Five foot ten, eyes are blue. <laughs> now let me think. Um, okay, Steve Howe in a few sentences, not, not too easy. Uh, maybe one sentence would be easier. <laughs> no, guitarist, uh, guitarist extraordinaire. Um, potentials. Many, many potentials hidden, you know, like my hurdy-gurdy playing, my dancing, all these things totally hidden. And I didn't even get a chance to dance in um, Asia videos. Uh, now, let's start again. Um, well, to answer that question, what is, who is, and 
how is Steve Howe? I would just say what I'd like to be remembered for, um, you know, when I'm walking down the street when I'm about 80 and somebody says, isn't that the guy who used to play guitar in those bands in the 60s, 70s, 80s and perhaps 90s? I would, uh, I'd like to be remembered as an uh, individual guitarist. That's always what I wanted to be, individual. The, you know, very important, that, because I think... Um, not that I want to stand out from the crowd like a sore thumb, because I don't think I do, but I wanted to uh, be my own style of guitarist, because what I liked about other guitarists was that you could identify them. So I even if a few people can say, you know, without even knowing it's me, they can hear it, that is the greatest compliment, because that's what I can do with Segovia, I can do that with all the great guitarists. I don't have to know it's them, I can, I can tell it's them. That's the greatest compliment you can pay to a musician, or maybe even a singer, you know, take Caruso, take Robert Teer, you know, take Peter Pierce, the great singers of the world, you know, Robert Plant, John Lennon, you know, I mean, you don't, somebody doesn't have to tell you. So that's a great thing. Uh, back to me, Steve Howe. I'm, I'm a family person, so I'm, it's very important to me that the people I love most, you know, know who I am and, and I get time with them. So I think in a way I'm a 50-50 uh, person, I'm 50% I'm into my career because I've always been career conscious but also um, some questions I got asked in the early 70s were like, well how, how, how can you have a family and be in a rock band? It's not difficult, you just have to put your foot down now and again and say I will be available to my family at this time instead of the usual criteria in music business is being available to the act, being available to the record company, or you know, like being available at 11 o'clock today to do this. That's great. Let, I, I always want to keep doing that, but as long as um, I never lose sight of the importance, personal importance to me, of my three children and my wife. Great. That's fantastic. Good. <laughs>